Yeah. 
father was still away from some of the things in our lives. And so he would hear things he did. He was willing to come to the church, but in the life that he did, going to the car to get things to vote. He prays for the worship here today. He would get things to recognize in our evening. So, Father, we have so many here in heaven to build to stand before us and say the song or prayer. We're especially grateful for Dale. He and his family who worked with him and worked with us here to live a long, pleasant life. So, Father, we pray that our engagement in all of be a bright, shining light this week and the new week will be desired to make you a great name. So, Father, we pray that you be the ones that have lost loved ones and keep families to go with, with them as they go through the time of, of the struggles and that they do know their mother or sister in heaven. We pray that you be the ones that are sick so much to page four for the song of invitation page four the next song will be 371 371 and all of God's singers get home we'll sing all three verses we heard the let's know from brother Derek all three verses 371 What a song of delight in a city so bright, every one can in heaven's fair door. How the ransom will ring, that the song in its praise, when all the Christ singers get home. When all the Christ singers get home, where never a sorrow will part.
is not unusual for many places and we have the same condition that sometimes prevails here that we can have a good house full on, on Sunday morning but then at other times our attendance is, is far less than that. Whenever we look at what David said in, in uh, Psalm 122, he said, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. He looked forward to the opportunity of being with God's people and to understand the importance of serving God as he had been directed to do. We find that Jesus made a point about the importance of worshiping the true and living God Whenever we find what happened to him in the course of the temptations that he endured in Matthew chapter 4. As you will recall, Satan had truly hit him at some weak points. He'd been fasting for 40 days. And he said, well, why don't you take these stones and make yourself something to eat? Certainly he had the power to do such. But in so doing, it would have put a distance between himself and and humanity. If he all used miraculous powers to supply his food, to ease his pain, and, and to help bear all of his burdens, then truly he didn't go through everything that we endure. And he reminded Satan that uh, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. The whole purpose for the prayer and fasting was to draw closer to God. And to randomly break this now at Satan's invitation was not in the plan. We find that other temptations took place. He appealed to, his, uh, to the idea of what the scriptures say, that God's going to take care of you. So he had him to, why don't you jump off the pinnacle of the temple and we'll just test out this, uh, this uh, promise and make sure that, that nothing happens to you. And once again, the Lord reminded him, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. And then finally they went up into the high mountain, just the two of them alone. And Satan basically appealed to his vanity of saying, look, I'll step out of the way. I'll give you all of the kingdoms of the world. You can have all the adoration, all the victories that you want. I will simply step out of the way. The only thing you need to do is to fall down and worship me. Acknowledge that I am greater than you are. And Jesus firmly answered him, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Whenever we start talking about the idea of worship, I think that there are many areas of that where we tend to struggle. Over in John chapter 4, Jesus was talking to the woman at the well and talk to her about what would be acceptable worship as it turns out to be in the day and time in which we live. And Jesus says in John chapter 4 and verse 23, But the hour cometh and now is, when the true worshippers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. As we start analyzing what's being said here, we need to come to our worship to God with the right attitude and the right spirit, with an earnestness, with a reverence, with an adoration of all that God has done for us. And then as well, our worship is to be in accord to truth. It's not that we craft some experience that is pleasing to us where we kind of choose, well, why don't we do this, and why don't we do that, and why don't we do it this way or that way? It's a matter of going back to see what the scriptures teach us is acceptable worship. And we find five activities of worship that are discussed in the New Testament by the first century Christians under the direction of the apostles. And so those are activities that we are to mirror even yet today. But, <coughs> excuse me. They're fighting with the drainage issues, some allergies. I just cannot seem to see. But let's just visualize something for a few moments this morning and talk a little bit about the reality of worship. Whenever we start thinking about the concept and the physical response that would come from us in worship, often 
color that very lacking because we are not accustomed to a society that even bows and shows respect for somebody else. We tend to talk about, you know, all men being created equal, getting a handshake or whatever, but there's not actually physical expression of the idea of worship and adoration of somebody who is elevated to look at, to be looked at as supreme, all powerful, and worthy of all of the praise and adoration that we can give to him. You know, if, as we assemble this morning, we sometimes make reference to the fact that we know that the Lord is here. In Matthew chapter 18, and going down to, to verse 20. Jesus says, where two or three are gathered together in my name, there I am in the midst of them. So as we assemble here to worship God today, he's able to see just how genuine we are. He's able to see where our thoughts really are. Are we focused upon the great God of heaven, the creator of heaven and earth? Are we thinking about his son that died for our sins? Do we nurture an appreciation of reverence and an adoration for that? Or is it just Sunday morning at the right time on the clock and this is where I'm supposed to be? And there's some actions we're going to go through today. I can check those off and I worship God. And now I hurry on with the rest of my day. You know, whenever we think about the reality of worship, how do you suppose it would affect us if things became much more physical? You know, whenever Jesus was resurrected from the dead, it was kind of quite a surprise in John chapter 20 when he appeared in the room where the disciples were. In verse 19 of John chapter 20, it says, In the same day and evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, when the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst and said unto them, Peace be unto you. And when he had so said, he showed unto them his hands and his side. Then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. And then said Jesus to them again, Peace be unto you, as my Father hath sent me, even so I sin you. Can you imagine what would be your reaction if we know that this is not promised in the scripture and all that kind of thing, but if this scenario happened today, if Jesus just physically appeared in our midst and there's no evidence, there's no doubting as to who it is. The evidence is there with the scars of uh, to his body. What would be our reaction? Now, initially, I'm sure for all of us, there would be, because of the new and the unusual, there would be a wave of fear initially of what is this? This is different than anything I've ever seen before. We would, we would be indeed somewhat shocked by having such an occurrence occur. But our reaction to that, I believe, would be somewhat tempered by the kind of worshiper that we are. Let's talk about the, the, the group that, for lack of a better word, I just coined the term, they're the consumer. When they come to, to worship, it doesn't really involve a whole lot of physical participation. They are here for a variety of, of reasons. They are here to take, so to speak, to be able to say that I've heard some things that were good to listen to. I've been able to observe what all went on today, who was there. I've caught up on all the news as to, to, to who's sick and this sort of thing. And so they are quick to absorb in what everybody else is doing. But as Jesus said on numerous occasions, 
there were individuals who would draw nigh unto me, you know, and, and appear to be giving me honors. He says, but their heart is far from me. There are some who would want to come. They assemble in a worship assembly because they expect to be entertained. They want to, the, their estimation of the sermon is going to, going to be evaluated on how long did the speaker speak? How much comedy and, and humor was incorporated into what he said? Um, you know, did I wind up feeling good about the time that I was together? Was it, did I have an emotional response to that? But there's not really much concern as to whether the truth is taught or not. We didn't double check the verses. We didn't pay much attention to how that message applied to my own personal life because we weren't really here hungering and thirsting after righteousness. We weren't here wanting to see how can I be better and what else can I do to serve God. You know, over in Matthew chapter 6, excuse me, chapter 5, in, in what's often referred to as the, the Beatitudes, Jesus pronounced a blessing in verse 6 on those who do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Do we come hungering and thirsting after righteousness? Are we coming with the desire to learn and to apply to our lives the things that the Bible says? Or is it just a box that needs to be checked off? If I don't come and attend, some of my family's going to fuss at me about it. If I don't come and attend, the elders may give me a call of concern, worried about why I'm, I'm not there with the, the, the people of God. And so I need to show up a little bit more to keep everybody else happy. Rather than realizing our need to be here with the Lord, and with his people to learn about how to better serve him. Over in Matthew chapter 6 and going down to verse 33, Jesus said, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. It should be our primary focus that we want to put the kingdom first. The, even the ordering of the activities of our busy schedule are so ordered putting the way of the church and the things of the church, the things that we can do in service to God, those things go to the top of the ledger and everything else works around that. Whenever it comes even to, to giving as we've been prospered, do we set that aside first and whatever other changes occur, we, we maybe will shuffle some funds, but that's the Lord's, we, we leave that there. Or is it all kind of haphazard. And what we do is is out of duty. It is just what is expected. I remember as a child growing up that it used to be, you know, as a little kid, maybe mom and dad would give you a quarter or they'd give you a dollar or something, and that was what you were going to put in the, the collection basket whenever it passed. And so that was the habit that you developed. And even though you graduate from college, have a nice job, and are very affluent in all that the Lord's given to you, you still put that dollar in on Sunday. Rather than truly it being a reflection of how you've been prospered. Now here again, you know, God knows the hearts of individuals. He knows the unique situations in each case. I'm not trying to legislate something bad in, in one way or the other here. It's just that sometimes we can be doing things from habit. Things that we do because we're just kind of consumers. It's like going to a concert. You go to, to enjoy the music, to enjoy the atmosphere, to enjoy the time, and then you go home with no real lasting benefit. And we can worship God that way. And, and so it's like we need to get our sip of religion every week to help kind of soothe our conscience a little bit. And if Jesus appeared in our midst, we'd say, well, you know, that, that's nice. That was unusual. We've never seen that happen before. But we got to go because if we don't get to the restaurants quick, there'll be such a wait in line, we won't get home at 3 o'clock. And so we're in a hurry to get somewhere else. And even the Lord's appearance doesn't have a very 
big impact. But then kind of on the other extreme of that scenario is that you have those who truly put their whole heart into worshiping God. They are here to get the most out of this time together that they possibly can glean. Maybe every verse that is read is a verse that they're familiar with. But then maybe there are some others that they hadn't thought about in that light in a long time or some pieces of information that they've never even considered at all. And they are grateful to have that information to ponder and to see how it might help them to do better. Over in Colossians in chapter 3, and going down to verse 23, it says, And whatsoever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord, and not unto men. So we try our best to participate in every aspect of the service. If there's something that needs to be done, we're quick to volunteer. We don't have to be begged into teaching a class or begged into helping out with this, that, or the other. Our hearts are overflowing with gratitude and looking forward with anticipation to what else can I do? And so we want to participate and to be involved. Whenever we sing praises to God, we, as best to our ability, we participate. In Ephesians chapter 5 and going down to, to verse 19, Paul said, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. My mother was tone deaf. She couldn't tell one pitch from another. When she was a kid, she wanted to take guitar lessons, and after a lesson or two, the teacher told my grandparents that this was a waste of time. She can't do this thing because she can't tell whether it's in pitch or not. Because she has no, no sense of tone and pitch whatsoever. And mom would laughingly say she couldn't carry a tune in a bucket with a lid on it. She just had very little ability in that way. But you know what? She tried. She realized that she probably wasn't going to, to, to do much. But what she said was make a joyful noise. But she said, at least I can do that. And so she was willing to participate in every aspect of the service as best she could to listen to the prayers to be able to say amen at the ending of those prayers because they were heartfelt they reflected sentiments that were important to us whenever it comes to giving as we've been prospering second corinthians uh, chapter 9 verses 6 and 7 said paul said but this i say he which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly and he which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. Every man according as he purposes in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth the cheerful giver. It's not mine to judge and assess what somebody else gives. That's a certain something that we work out, we purpose in our own hearts, but it certainly is a reflection of the love and appreciation that we have for the Lord. And so we want to do our best in showing that love. And we're filled with love. Love for our fellow man, love for our brothers and sisters in Christ, and appreciation for all that God has done for us. And so we try as best we can to reflect that love in every aspect of what we do. Over in 2 John, going down to verse 1, beginning. It says, the elder unto the elect lady and her children, whom I love in the truth, and not I only, but also all they that have known the truth, for the truth's sake, which dwelleth in us, and shall be with us forever. Grace be with you, peace and, and uh, mercy and peace from God the Father, and from the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father, in truth and love. I rejoice greatly that I found of thy children walking in truth, as we have received a commandment from the Lord. And now I beseech thee, lady, not as though I wrote a new commandment unto you, but that which ye have had from the beginning, that you love one another. And this is love, that we walk after his commandments. And this is the commandment, that is, that ye have heard from the beginning, ye should walk in it. The kind of love and appreciation 
that the contributors have, so to speak. They, they want to manifest their love. They want to help. They try to, to bear one another's burden. They're just trying their best to be the kind of servants that God wants them to be. If Jesus were to appear in physical presence today, and we were that kind of worshiper, we wouldn't be ashamed to fall at his feet in adoration and praise. We find that we're not accustomed to that. We're not accustomed to showing that kind of abject reverence and praise and respect. But whenever we truly put things in perspective, the greatest and the letter, lesser, we are his creation. And he deserves every manifestation of love and of respect and adoration that we can muster. In Revelation 1 and verse 17, and John says, And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. And he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. John was overcome with adoration and appreciation. Later on, he talks about a heavenly setting in the fourth chapter of Revelation, verses 10 and 11. It says, The four and twenty elders fell down before him that sat on the throne, and worshipped him that liveth forever and ever, and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. Everything is about Christ about adoration of him, about worship of him, and to those worshipers who worship in spirit and in truth, yes, there is the intimidation of something unusual that had happened, but upon realization of who we were in the presence of, I'm convinced it would have a, pro a profound effect upon us as we've tried our best throughout a lifetime to worship God and his son Jesus Christ in the best way that we could. But then there might be another class as well. And you know, while the the consumers were there to observe and to just kind of soak up a little bit of religion, there are some who can come in with kind of an agenda of their own, and they come in as the critics. Nothing's right. Nothing is not like it needs to be. This should have been changed. This should have been done differently. This was not appropriate. Everything should have been better. And that was kind of the disposition that Jesus had to deal with in the first century as he was working with the apostles and teaching from city to city. In Matthew chapter 12, there is an occasion where his disciples were hungry. And the idea of gleaning a little bit of food as you walk past a, a farmer's field or whatever was not a violation of law. You weren't stealing for somebody. There was a certain degree of sharing that was to be expected. But here in Matthew chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, it says, At that time Jesus went on the Sabbath day through the corn with, and his disciples were a hunger and began to pluck the ears of corn and to eat. And when the Pharisees saw it, they said it again, Behold, thy disciples do that which is not lawful to do upon the Sabbath day. They had a whole host of traditions as to how the Sabbath day was supposed to be observed. And certainly it was not expected that they were supposed to fast all of that day, that they were hungry and, and uh uh, they couldn't pick up something something to eat, but it was the expectation that that should have been prepared the day before. And, and you should have had everything ready. And why are you traveling on the Sabbath day anyway, trying to go a Sabbath day's journey? That's poor planning on your part. That's poor choice based on you. But they were actually pulling ears of corn and, and shall we say, shucking and eating it on the Sabbath day. And that was some kind of work that was forbidden. And throughout this chapter, the Lord has to help them understand that he is indeed the Lord of the Sabbath. But they didn't want to see that. In the 15th chapter, 
Once again, they were complaining. In the 15th chapter, uh, verses uh, 1 and 2. Then came, Jesus, came to Jesus the scribes and the Pharisees, which were of Jerusalem, saying, Why do thy disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? For they wash not their hands when they eat bread. Here again, there's traditions that we've got in place, and they're not abiding by these traditions. And, and this is just absolutely terrible that they should, should eat with, with unwashed hands. And Jesus goes on to tell them, well, you've instituted all these traditions, and some of them are in opposition even to the plain law of God. He said, you're invalidating some of the laws of God by the traditions you put in place. And he called them hypocrites. And in verse 8, he said, this people draw not into me with their mouth, they honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. But in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrine the commandments of men. Those traditions and those man-made laws are more important to you than what was given by the inspiration of God. Jesus called these religious leaders out on numerous occasions for their pure hypocrisy. Over in Matthew chapter 23, he kind of explained what they were doing. Then spake Jesus unto the multitude and to his disciples, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat, and all therefore whatsoever they bid you observe, that observe and do, as they teach you the law, as they show you what the commandments say. But do not ye after their works, for they say and do not. For they bind heavy burdens and grievous to be borne, and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. He says in verse 24, Ye blind guides, which strain in a gnat, and swallow a camel. There are some folks who, if Jesus were to appear even here this morning, would complain about the interruption. We don't do that. That's not normal. What's he doing here? I've got other things to do. I'm not comfortable with this. I'm out of here. And other such comments could be made. You know, sometimes we think about some of those joyous moments of, of maybe even someone being baptized into Christ. But I'm I'm too busy with things. I can't stay for that baptism. Y'all take care of that. I'm gone. You know. Maybe we really need to examine our hearts. And think about why we are here and how much can we get out of this worship experience. You know, we can get so stuffy and detached that we just sit and wait for it to be over. And now it's time to go. And for some, they are very thrilled that that's, that's the end of it. But are we anxious to meet the Lord? Happy to be in his presence? Or are we like the ones that Paul warned Timothy against in 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 5, that there are some who might embrace a form of godliness, but they deny the power thereof. It's not about Christ. It's about meeting all kinds of other human objectives. And after I put this lesson together and, and talked about the, the various perspectives that individuals might have, in terms of their worship experience, I'm not the judge in that. But over time and watching human nature a little bit, some of these observations have kind of come to the forefront. But then I thought of another C word that kind of fit as well. And that's simply talking about the cowardly. What I mean by that is that we'll see the good in serving the Lord. We see the importance of worshiping Him and being obedient to His commands. We understand that heaven is reserved for those who have obeyed Him. And we know that there are steps that we need to do to obey Him. Jesus commanded that we must be baptized, Mark 16, 16. That baptism is for the remission of our sins, Acts chapter 2 and verse 38. We know that. And we tend to want to get to that one of these days. 
Maybe. But what would our friends say? Or maybe there's some other family members that I have that, that would frown upon my commitment to the Lord like that. And they, they don't come to this church, and so they wouldn't approve of me becoming a, a member here or whatever. And so in fear of what others might say, or maybe even the fear that I just wouldn't be strong enough to be faithful unto death, forgetting that Paul told the Philippians that you can do all things through Christ who will strengthen you. You can be faithful if you want to be. Even though all that's in place, we still hold back. We're still unsafe. We're still separated from God because of our sin. And over in Revelation 21 and verse 8, when it talks about those who are going to have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, it talks about some pretty horrible characters. The abominable and the murderers and the whoremongers and the sorcerers and the idolaters and all liars. So what's the very first one on the list? But the fearful. Those who just are so afraid that maybe I can't do it. So once again, we come close. We kind of come and observe what all is going on and have a desire to maybe want to do more. Well, we still haven't had the courage to take that first step. I've heard it proclaimed all of my life that if you'll take that first step, the Lord will help you take the rest. You can make your life right in the sight of God. Even this morning. To be baptized for the remission of your sins. If there's some steps that you need to take. To make your relationship with God more than what it is right now. I pray that maybe some of the things I've said this morning will spur you a little bit more to, to try harder and, and do more. And certainly, if you're outside the ark of safety, if you're not a member, yet a member or a child of God, if there's some way we can help to get that taken care of, we urge you to come as together we stand. Amen. I am thy, O Lord, I have heard thy voice and it told
before we take the Lord's Supper, let's open our song books to 346. 346. Hope that God's in changing hands. We sing the first verse. <laughs> Time is filled with swift transition. the Corinthians, as often as they were to take of the bread, they also would take of the fruit of the vine. Remember the blood of the covenant that Jesus shed on that cross, and so remember and honor him uh, for that and for his care for us. Let's also give thanks for the fruit of the vine. Dear Father, as we think about the, what Jesus did for us, that the only pure and righteous, sinless thing that ever been on this earth Lord, to think that he gave his life's blood so that we might have eternal life. 
He loves us and you love us. Help us, Lord, and, and we just appreciate so much uh, this this service each first week, first day of the week that, that helps us to and reminds us of what was Christ was paid for our salvation. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. the Lord's Supper, we also, on the first day of the week, we lay by the sword, we've been prosperous, as also uh, I mentioned in the uh, letter to the Corinthians. And so if you have not uh, taken advantage of that opportunity, then also do that in the basket around the building. <coughs> Everyone, please stand. Say thank you to our visitor. And all who are here present this morning, thank you for being here. We'll sing the first verse of 401, and the brother leads us. Here we are, but straying pilgrims, here our path is often dim. But to cheer us on our journey still, we sing this way, our hill. Wander over the rolling river, where the shining mansions rise. Yeah. <laughs> 